But Pastor Heinrich, thank you for sharing the word with us. Um, you're such, such a man of God, and we just want to bless you for your faithfulness and yeah, for your humility, for the example you set for all of us. Amen. Well. <laughs> thank you, brother. Really appreciate that. And um, yeah, if you, um, if you really want to just be spoiled, go and visit my mom and dad. You'll be, you'll be spoiled. She makes the best chocolate cake in the world. And um, yeah, mom and dad, it's an honor to follow in your footsteps and see us. Thank you for the opportunity to minister here tonight. I also just want to extend a warm welcome to all of our friends streaming in, especially those guys from Berlin and Germany. Guten Abend. We pray that you will enjoy this uh, evening service uh, with all of us. Let us uh, pray. Father, we, we thank you, Lord, for your presence that's so tangible here in this place already. We thank you, Lord, for what Shofar Stellenbosch represents. God, I, I place, Lord, that you have kept your hand upon, Lord, over many years. And we honor this place and what it signifies, God. We, we honor the leadership of this church, Lord. See us in Louise. We, we thank you for bringing them, Lord, to this place for such a time as this. God, appointing them and positioning them here, Father, we thank you that you have raised them up as uh, guardian angels, God, in a way, just watching over all of these young people, Lord, and, and bridging the gap between generations even. Thank you for a mighty release of a new intergenerational anointing, God, that you've prepared for them to walk in and that will flood this congregation, 2019 especially, like a mighty tsunami, God, just bringing together generations in a, in a beautiful way, unlike anything that your body has seen in a long, long time. And we honor you, God, for that in Jesus' name. Amen. So, you guys are writing exams, and I'm being timed to make sure that I give you enough time to go home and study. When um, I was here studying many years ago, I know none of you guys do this, but I did believe that the more services you attended, the more brownie points you scored with God, and it would go better with your exam, but I know that none of you guys are that silly. You don't... Uh, you don't uh, fall for that one. But um, yeah, it was amazing back in the day just to be able to, to be here, to grow up in Shofar, to experience so much of the Lord's presence here and his blessing here. Um, 1994 was when I arrived here in Stellenbosch and just walked into this church and this was it. This was home and uh, met my wife here and just had incredible moments in the Lord's presence. Made awesome friends here for many, many years. And uh, it's an amazing privilege to serve the Lord with his awesome leaders. And, and see us ask me to to share a little bit around identity. And you guys are smack bang in the middle of a series on identity. Um, and I wanna ask you to buckle up. I wanna ask you to, to bear with me as we, as we get into this. And as we approach the word, what I've discovered over the years is that the more I get to know God, the more I get to know his word, the more I know how little I know about God. And the more respect I have for the word of God and and from time to time, almost the more fearful in a way I come when I approach the word, understanding that if I really approach the word the way that I should, I will be profoundly impacted. I will be challenged, I will maybe even get upset from time to time, but if I really engage the word of God honestly, then it impacts me and sometimes it hits me between the eyes and it turns me inside out, upside down. Uh, when I'm just approaching the word casually, I can read the word and read scripture and leave as if I've just read men's health or anything else. But when my heart is in a good place and I approach the word reverently, respectfully, like we were ushered into God's presence now, then I'm ready for surgery. Amen? I'm ready for God to come and do some stuff in my heart. So I pray that he will use a scalpel tonight and not the sledgehammer, as he sometimes does. Call me Mr. Stone is the, the title of my sermon tonight. Does anybody remember the Flintstones? Yeah, many years ago, it was the Flintstones. It's got nothing to do with my sermon. Just wanted to see if you remember that. All right. <laughs> Coconut. Colored. So-called colored. Cape colored. Gamsekind, brown person, first nation, 
Koi, Koi son, take your pick. Those were all names and labels that I've been called over the years. Things that at various times in my, in my life were given to me, uh, uh, thrown at me or spat out at me or written about me or, or, or spoken over me. Um, and what I've begun to discover as I was looking at this whole issue of identity, it is so important to understand that identity cuts to the core of who we are as individuals. Identity is so intensely personal that it, it literally is something that's between you and God. It's, it's, it's between you and the mirror. It's between you and the person that knows you the closest, and yet it goes beyond what anybody else around you can know. It is, it is sometimes an issue that's buried so deep down inside of you that you don't even know it until pressure gets put on you. And it comes out. And then you begin to discover so much about your identity. And the last couple of weeks, Sias has been ministering to you around this and, and just some of the questions that he threw out at you, I don't know where you can, you can see it, but you must remember that if your identity and your destiny does not come from God, then you might be confronted with questions, or phrases, or words, uh, internal dialogue. In, in other words, internal conversations that you are having with yourself and you're mostly very much unaware of these conversations until you are having to write an exam. And then something like, you will never make it, comes up. You're never aware of this until you have to step out and you have to trust God to, to do something in faith. And you will hear, you're a failure. You, you, you're very much never aware of those, of those phrases and of those, those accusations sometimes that come against you until you either slow down enough or you hit a pressure point in your life. And a pressure point can come in an exam time. A pressure point can come and will probably come during mission time when you are with 140 other people who are different to you. Amen. You will experience pressure points if there are any of you that are going on a mission and thinking that it will just be amazing, glorious. You will love the other person all the time, see Christ in them, hear Christ in them, and will just think that they're the most blessed thing that has ever come from heaven. Then... I've got a surprise for you. You will be tested. But the glorious thing about a test is a test is always there to upgrade you to the next level. Amen? A test hasn't been designed to cause you to fail to stay behind where you are right now. The test has been designed to upgrade you to the next year, to the next phase of your life. And those of you guys going on mission, those of you guys in a test right now, maybe a relational test, maybe a spiritual test, the test has been designed so you can pass it. God wants you to pass that test. And the test that we as a church are having to pass right now is the identity test. So I'm delighted that you guys are spending some time on this and, and hopefully you, you have those, those slides and you can work them through in your small groups as well. But our identity in Christ really boils down to who we are in him and who we are becoming in him. And I like what Sia said there. It's who we are. We know who we are in Christ, but we also understand that I am still becoming who I am. I'm still discovering who I am. And it happens in phases, it happens in different seasons of my life. As I begin to discover more about myself and more about the people around me, the more I begin to discover who Christ has made me to be. So, so the way really for you to find out who you are is not to focus on who you are, but is to focus on who God is. Because the more you discover who God is, the more you discover who you are created to be. Because you look at God, you see a mirror image of who he has created you to be. So it is crucial to have your identity rooted in Christ because it is the key to our real wholeness. And the world's identity is, is, is coming at us and, and, and bombards us through two primary means, what we do and what we achieve. And that's mostly how the world labels us, what we do and what we achieve. So performance-drivenness, achievement-driven lifestyles, uh, a focus on 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 action, a focus on things that people can see on the outside. And based on that, based on how successful you were, based upon your last success or your last failure, that is mostly what people use to label you or to judge you. Your identity, according to the world, is I'm an engineer, or I'm a teacher, or I'm a pastor, or I'm a graphic designer, and a lot of us attach our, our, 
identity based on what we do. But what the world also does is, it doesn't just bombard us with identity questions via what it wants us to do, it also bombards us with identity questions around how we look. How we look. So it's not just what you do, it is also how you look. That the world uses to bombard you with an identity image. Right, and so, so those phrases that I, that I used are, are phrases that are familiar to me. Some of you might not know them. Some of you might know them. But they were all based upon a look. They were all based upon an identity given to a group of people based upon a certain look. Okay? And back in the day, in my family, we, we are sort of a smorgasbord of different races in and, and genes and all sorts of stuff mixed together. And our community that I predominantly come from is a social construct. In other words, there was never such a thing as colored people. That's why the term so-called was used because it was a term that was engineered by a, a political party. They decided we're gonna label a group of people that came forth through white people and black people having intercourse with one another, falling in love with one another, sometimes through rape, sometimes through all sorts of other things. And we're gonna label this people, this group of people, we don't know what to do with them because they're not black and they're not white. We're gonna label them so-called colored people. All right, and so I want you to just remember this context a little bit. Most of you were born after 1992, 94. I would, who was born in the 90s? Well, quite a few, 2000s, any? born in 2000 it's not a shame hallelujah praise God for you okay your damage is less hallelujah praise the Lord all right the closer you're born to this day the less your damage it is important <laughs> all right it is important for us as believers in church that if we talk about identity not to merely be very spiritual about it but to understand that the identity that you learn about and the things that you learn about at Bible school in a place like this, that identity that you are having to pursue, that identity that you are having to discover, that identity will clash with the identity that was given to you by the world. And that identity was given to you based upon your performance or based upon how you look. Do you agree with that? In the nation in which we are living, and I can say it not just in our nation, but all over the globe, it's, it's the case. It is either what you are doing or how you look. Now, in our country, unfortunately, a lot of that is based upon the color of your skin, the tone color of your skin. But it can be based upon your gender. It can be based upon a lot of things. Look at how much money people make out of how we look or how they want us to look how much money they are making out of selling us things so that we can conform to a certain image. If you can just look this way, dress this way, wear this brand of clothing or this watch, it's not just good enough to have a fitness tracker, you must have a fitness tracker that can phone and that can measure your sleep and can measure how many glasses of water you drink and all sorts of things. There's always a next thing that you have to wear in order to be seen as with it, to be very fit. You know, the smarter your watch is, the fitter you are, obviously, because that watch carries magic. You put it on and just like, zam, you feel fit, you look fit, it's just like something supernatural that happens. We all know it's not the truth, and yet we still buy it. We still buy it. Why? Because subtly we've swallowed the lie that my identity is based upon what I wear. I just wear this thing, I can just get this next thing, I will feel better about myself. And so it is important for us to understand, it's important for you to understand that the things that you are busy thinking about, and I, I pray that you are busy internalizing this, I pray that you will use your December holidays to go back to these sermons by Pastor Sias and meditate upon them because they are probably one of the most crucial sermon series that you ever would have done in your life. Because irrespective of whatever season you find yourself in, the question of identity will remain with you until you breathe out your last. When you are 80 years old or maybe 55 years old and you suffer from dementia, when you lose control over your bodily functions, the issue of identity will be key to your life. And all of those achievements and all of those things and all of those things that you take for granted right now as a 
viral young person, when all of those things fall away and your fitness watch will not do anything for you in that moment, the question of identity will be crucial. It'll be crucial to you as you fall in love, it'll be crucial to you as you, as you get married and you name your kids and you grow in your job and in your career and heaven forbid you might lose a loved one. The issue of identity is crucial to how you will handle those challenges. One of the most beautiful songs in Shofar Band is, you are the potter, we are the clay. What is that? That is identity. I'm the clay, I'm not the potter. And for me, it's been a journey, and, and, and the reason I'm sharing these labels with you is, is simply to give you an understanding that as blessed as I was growing up, and I grew up in a blessed home, incredible parents who loved me and who, who prayed for me from a very young age, and I grew up with a sense of, of, of rootedness, geborgenheid is the Afrikaans word, that I was, I was rooted and grounded in their love and rooted and grounded in, in God's love. But even as rooted and as grounded as I was in their love, I still lived in a very real physical place. A real physical place that tried its everything with a lot of spiritual and supernatural backing behind it. And this is what I want you to understand. The issue of identity is not a spiritually neutral issue. It is a spiritually loaded issue with heaven on the one side and all the forces of hell on the other side. Because the question is, do you believe that you are a son, daughter of God, loved unconditionally by him? Do you believe that you can enter his presence without performing? Do you believe that, or do you believe that I'm not good enough, I can never get into his presence, I need to earn my way into his presence? And the devil will come with everything at you. And for some of you, the cultural thing maybe isn't, isn't relevant. I think you're a unique person, unique individual. If you live in our country and it's not relevant to you at all. So I want you just to bear with me a little bit. I'm going to read for you verse uh, from 1 Peter 2 verse 45. And I'm, I'm going to take you as we go through this script just a little bit on a, on a journey. We are living stones, that's why in terms of identity, nowadays I like to refer to myself as Mr. Stone. Right? If you wanna put a label on me, call me Mr. Stone, all right? Coming to him, and Peter is speaking to his friends, he's speaking about Jesus. Coming to Christ as to a living stone. What, Mr. Livingston? A living stone, right? We come to Jesus as to a living stone. All right, so, so the Bible refers to Jesus as a stone, but as a living stone. Rejected indeed by men, but chosen by God and precious. And here we see this dichotomy, this continuous ebb and flow, which you will experience in your life every time. That on the one hand, you will experience like Jesus did, intense rejection. And yet on the other hand, you will experience that you are chosen and called by God. You will never just have the called, chosen, loved, affirmed, believed in by God. Unfortunately, you live in a fallen world where you will experience rejection. Jesus experienced it. Father God didn't save Jesus from rejection. Jesus went through it. And if we are going to follow Christ, Jesus said, then we will suffer the same things that he suffered from. And sometimes we get saved and born again into an environment and we do everything within our power to avoid the being rejected by men. But everything within our power, some of you, even in a, in a room like this, will do everything within your power to avoid being rejected by the people around you. You might even go on a mission trip to avoid being rejected by those around you. And yet the Bible is clear on it, that rejection will come our way. If we're gonna be disciples of Christ and followers of Christ, then we will experience rejection. But here's the beauty. Scripture says that Jesus was chosen by God. I love this, how Peter just goes on. He says he was chosen by God and precious. I love this. Chosen by God and precious. Then he goes on, he says, you also. In other words, you also living stones, also rejected by this world, but also called chosen and precious to God. As living stones, you are being built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. You're a living stone. You're called, you're precious. 
And the beauty is this, that each one of us, as you are sitting here in this room, you have been called by God, equipped by God, chosen by God to live for something greater than just yourself. What, what's the difference between, between a living stone and just a brick lying around somewhere? Just a stone that is just next to the road and the stones in this building. What's the, what's the difference? The one has got purpose and the other one doesn't. The, the brick only finds its, its purpose in the sense that it is being used together with other bricks to create an, a, a, a hall like this where the presence of God can come and people can listen to the word of God. That gives that brick, Cora brick or whatever they used, a purpose. Outside of this purpose, that brick can lie next to the side of the road, next to the end two, and somebody can pick up that brick and throw it through somebody else's windshield. It's still a brick, isn't it? But its purpose is different. On its own, by itself, without its original purpose, it is being abused. You are a living stone, the Bible says, called by God, chosen by God, precious to God. To, to become part of a living, breathing house. A house that isn't limited to the four walls of this building, but a house that goes to Plettenberg Bay and a house that goes to, 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 to Uppington and to Claver and to Chenin and to Klerksdorp. And wherever you go, part of a living, breathing house of God. A living stone called by God to form something precious and something beautiful. Here's the thing, if, if Jesus were to have been born today in our context here in Stellenbosch, I know many of you guys aren't from Stellenbosch, but if Jesus were to be born into our context, into this town, he would probably, in all likelihood, have been born in Kaimandi. And probably would have been the son of a taxi driver. And I wonder how many of us in our context would have looked at the son of that taxi driver as, here is the savior of the world. Sometimes we read scripture and we decontextualize it so much because we're so used to the story. But when it says that the people rejected Jesus, they didn't reject Jesus because they just, they just, was he lackery bony? You know, they just didn't have any brain cells. They rejected him because he didn't conform to their expectations. He didn't look the way they wanted him to look. He didn't fit the mold. He didn't speak the lingo. He came from the wrong side of town. And to the people in Kaimandi, for them, the savior of the world would probably be born in the Boert and be the son of a CEO of Mediclinic or something. Do you get my drift? He would be that different that they're just like, we, just, we can't. Jesus, the savior just can't come from a place like that. It's just not, it's not, just not you know, it just can't happen. He must come from someone like us. And that's the thing about Jesus. You cannot put him in a box. Black people can't claim him. White people can't claim him. He's for everyone. He is for everyone. And so it is important for you to understand that as you engage with the issue of identity, it is important for you to understand what were the things that shaped my identity. And see, I start from this so powerfully, the greatest Determining factor probably that shapes our identity is our understanding of how much our father loves us. And the way that we were raised at home has a massive influence on our identity, massive. And see, as touching and I believe a lot of healing has come to so many of you. But, but outside of the home context, there's the culture in which we grow up as well. And that continues to bombard us, continue to bombard us. I'm, I'm amazed how often I would speak to people and something would happen a motorcyclist would be cycling somewhere and there's an accident or, or our, our, our kids would meet somebody at school. And it's interesting, the kids, when they try to explain to me what the child looks like, sort of the last thing that they would refer to is the, the color of the, the kid's skin. It's amazing how often when you speak to older people and, and it's like, you know, it was that guy, it was that black guy or that white guy, or like, it's still sometimes the first thing that we refer to. It's still there. And if, if we are going to be rooted as believers in this present day and age, it is important for you to contextualize your identity. I'm a child of God, and yet I live in a country within a multicultural context with a lot of layers, like onions, onion rings. 
And you have to be aware of the fact that you have a lot of layers around your identity. And Christ lives inside of you, the spirit of resurrection. The one that raised Jesus from the dead lives inside of you. But guess what? He speaks Afrikaans or English or Tosa or Sutu or Zulu through you. Right? So he's, he's dressed in your culture. And you have got to wrestle with the fact how much of the dress that's around Jesus inside of me is cooperating with Jesus inside of me or is resisting Jesus inside of me. How much of my culture that is wrapped around this flesh and bone, that's wrapped around Jesus Christ living inside of me, in other words, my true identity, how much of that is cooperating and is a vehicle through which Jesus can love others around me and can serve others around me and can lead others around me and heal others around me, and how much of that is a resistance? And I can't tell you that you've got to go and figure that out for yourself. But figure it out. Have the questions. Think about it. You know, my, my first awareness of, of the cultural things happening outside of my home that impacts my home was when we arrived in Gaddis. Anybody from Gaddis? Anybody? Just want to see, make sure I don't offend anybody. But it's a beautiful place, all right? In springtime, it's beautiful. Other parts of the year, it's... But asphalt. <laughs> Yes, slightly less green. That's a beautiful place. We lived there for four years, I think. But it was in Garis that I, for the first time, be, uh, I think it was five when we moved there. The first time I began to understand that, yes, we've got this loving environment at home and things are, are fantastic and we, we're playing and we're having fun, but there's a bigger world outside of that. And, and we were, uh, there was this place a shop in town, we would go to the town, and I would go and buy some sweets. And then I discovered that, you know, just walking up and buying sweets where everybody else was buying sweets, you know, wasn't the acceptable thing. That there was a, a corner, you had to go around the outside, you had to go around the back and through a window and you had to buy your stuff there. And that's the first time that I'm, I'm like, I'm loved and I'm accepted at home and, and I'm, I'm amazed. My dad plays with us and he's loving and affectionate and he reads us stories and my mom is there for us. But then outside of that, there's a context where I realize, okay, so I can't go in there, but other people who look differently, they can go in there. And so over the years, things like that. First time I do, second time I do, I have a tooth extraction, that's why go to the dentist, I said, Jesus, just take me to heaven. I'd rather just like go straight, straight to heaven unless they knock me out completely. All right, so the first guy that, that pulled the tooth was a, a GP in Gaddis. God bless his soul. Uh, but second one was in Beaufort West. Had to go as well. You know, and then you, go, you can't go in the front. You go down the alleyway and you go and wait at the back where there's a special chair for non-European people. And I can name you many incidences like that, just one after the other. In, uh, in Uppington, when we, we moved, when they removed the Group Areas Act, and finally you could live wherever you wanted to live. We moved from the one neighborhood in Uppington to, to another one that was close to my dad's job. You know, um, it was weird waking up the next day and finding your neighbor's rubbish in your yard. Just in a couple of days after that, finding your cat killed. You know, just all sorts of things that began to just like, things are happening here, things, are, things are, are, are coming against us. And even though we're sheltered and we're a loving community inside of our home, there are challenges on the outside. And I thank my, my, my folks for sheltering us and protecting us and never being bitter and never speaking negatively, even about the government of that time. I want to encourage some of you, you think you've got issues with the present government? There were people who had more issues many years ago with the government of the day and chose to still honor that government. My mom and dad amongst others. Never spoke negatively about the government, loved them, spoke well of white people. Why? Because they understood that they couldn't allow poison into my identity. They understood that there was something inside of me that had to remain soft and innocent in spite of everything that was coming against us. And so as I, as I, as I came to Vast, and this is where I want to sort of pull the things together with where you guys are at. I came to show far in. It was an amazing church, walked in, and I, and I knew this was the place that God had for me. Knew it. But here I began to ask some questions. Here I, be, I began to, to, to wrestle with a few things that had built up inside of me. 
And, and here God began to really just set me free from, from subconscious things that I had allowed to just get into my psyche, into my identity. Spiritually speaking, was I good enough? Was I good enough to, to run with the others? Was I good enough to, to, to make it at varsity? Was I good enough to make it at varsity? Was I good enough to make it at church? And she has, doesn't know this, but 1995 was a massive healing for me. I went on a mission trip with him. And it was incredible. It was one, one guy on the trip confessed to me afterwards and he said, Heinrich, I didn't rate you at all. I just didn't think that, that jylle mense, jy het in jylle gehad om so geestelik te wees. Yeah, I heard that afterwards, after the trip. I'm glad he, I didn't know what he thought about me beforehand. But she has believed in me. We dreamt together and when we, we fasted together and we prayed together and, and, and we could be brothers together. And, and, and because of that, some of the stuff that I carried with me in terms of the culture was broken down within the church. But it wasn't plain sailing. And I want to say this to you, that if you think that just being in the same church is good enough to break those stereotypes, then you are mistaken. Just being in the same church and just worshiping together isn't good enough, saints, because it's not good enough for the world. If we want to engage with the world, we are needing to have some conversations with one another. And that will mean that you will have to get into somebody else's life. Get into somebody else's life. Go and visit them in their house. Go and visit them where they live, in their, in their room. Get into their lives. Get into their lives. And I'll never forget that mission trip and then just a long weekend where I was, I was all by myself. And most people had gone home. And I used to make up wonderful excuses about why I couldn't go on camps and all sorts of things. And it's mostly because I didn't always have the finances for those kinds of things. And I mostly made up a very good excuse, like I have to study. I'm very conscientious. But I'll never forget my deliverance was, all I had that week was the word of God. And I just, I just went to scripture, just read scripture. I still have the notes. I wrote them down, I confessed them over me. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And this life that I now live in the flesh, I live according to the faith of the son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And in that moment, as I, as I began to just work through the stuff inside of me, I said, Jesus, how can this be that in church there can be one experience and yet outside there's a different experience? I feel schizophrenic. I feel like this amazing spiritual experience and incredible brothers with me in church. And then, you know, some of those guys were from Uppington with me. And then we go back home to Uppington and like, yeah, how's it, man? Oh, no. Let me not greet him because he obviously doesn't want to greet me. Turn, turn around. God, how does that, how does that work? And there was a long time ago, things have changed. It's not the same anymore. But what I do want to say to you is that many of you are having to engage just with what is the impact of my experiences up to this moment, culturally speaking, that impacts upon my identity. And you are more than each and every experience that you have had. Some of you are in a place where you are still having, you, you still submitted and expose the conversations your parents and grandparents are having from different sides of the spectrum. And you've just got to bring those things to the Lord and say, God, I refuse anger. I refuse bitterness. I refuse, and it's not easy. Many of you guys live on farms. Many of, many of, you, of your parents live on farms. Many of your parents live in informal settlements. The challenges are real. And it's not just a question of what's right or what's wrong. It's a question of identity. Each one of those experiences are aimed at getting you to believe a lie about who you are as a child of God and about who the person sitting next to you are as a child of God or a potential child of God. So allow me to try and wrap up a series that I want to do in, in 10 minutes. Peter goes on to, to speak about this fact that we are, we are living stones and then Stephen read this portion earlier, speaks about the, the Pharisees and, and Jesus dealing with the Pharisees. So on, so on the one hand, you've got the cultural impact on your life. You know, as I began to just trust the Holy Spirit, to open my eyes to look at myself the way that Christ looks at me. 
to renounce the lies and to say, I refuse to be labeled. I'm not a so-called. I'm not anything anybody else tries to label me. I'm a child of God. And I wish I could tell you that it was just like that. It's like the song we sing, we fix our eyes on you. How many of you know it's a daily process, fixing your eyes on Christ? It's a daily process. And the bombardments and the lies of the devil will not stop just because you make a decision to have your identity shaped around Christ. But what you begin to discover is that the things that used to trip you up, now suddenly instead of being a rottweiler, it becomes a little chihuahua or something. You can kick that thing at the door. Uh, okay, I'm not talking about abusing right, animals, just figuratively speaking, right? Spiritually speaking. Don't go out here and say, the leader of Shofar says, kick chihuahuas. <laughs> but it becomes easier. It becomes easier. And here's my, my, my question to you guys. You don't know what God has called you to do. You don't know where you're going to be 20 years from now. And I'm thankful that God gave me a window of opportunity, adversity, where I had to wrestle through. I studied history, and so I read a lot of stuff that my folks never told me. I was confronted with a lot of things. I had a, I had a grandmother that she used to speak and speak and speak, and so she would speak to us about the forced removals and how they were disinherited because a great-grandfather was a white person, married a Malay slave girl. And so she was sort of a source of, of information on the one hand, but for the rest, we didn't really speak too much about it. And I'm thankful to God that I was confronted with the realities and I'm thankful to God for a safe church where I was able to have honest conversations with people who loved me and who believed in me. And I'm thankful for parents who, who, who kept their hearts pure and soft and, and instilled in me a desire to live purely before God. Because I wonder whether I would have been able to love the people I'm leading now had I allowed my identity to be tainted and to be crushed by the baggage of the past. I, I wonder whether I would have been able to see people for who they are and not see them as color of their skin, part of a generation and did this or that. And so many of my friends at Varsity are still stuck there. Can't get away from it. Still talk about the whiteies, the Buddha and all of that. Can't get away from that. Still stuck there. And only the gospel can transition you out of that place to a place where the blood of Christ speaks louder. You know, I lost some friends at Varsity. Why? Because the brothers in church were more real to me than the brothers from my same ethnic background. That's how real really it became to me. That's how precious the living house became for me. So on the one hand, you have the cultural impact very quickly. On the other hand, very often with the cultural impact comes the religious impact that's aimed at your identity. So allow me to finish with these two portions of scripture. Matthew 9 says, And Jesus passed on from there, and he saw a man named Matthew sitting at the tax office. So he saw Matthew doing what Matthew was always doing, sinning. All right? He was, no, 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 no. It's not a sin to, SARS, they're not sinning. All right? SARS is not sinning. What I'm saying is Matthew was exploiting the poor, right? He was taking what he needed to give to the Romans, and then he was also taking for himself, right? So Jesus finds Matthew busy sinning. He's a corrupt politician, corrupt government official. And he says to Matthew, Matthew, follow me. Now Matthew had a label, tax collector, slapped on him. He's, uh, the historians tell us that the money of the tax collectors weren't even received in the synagogue as offering was considered to be that dirty. They couldn't even give anything to the poor. The poor wouldn't even receive it because it was considered to be that unholy. Nobody wanted anything to do with the tax collectors. Matthew didn't wake up one day dreaming of a career as a tax collector. You just don't do that kind of thing. Something happened in him life, his life, a crushing took place that, that pushed him into betraying his own people and exploiting them. And everybody else saw the tax collector and yet Jesus saw Matthew. Jesus saw through the label, walked up to Matthew's life as he was busy sinning, walked into his life and says, follow me. And so he arose and he followed Christ. And now it happened that Jesus said at the table in the house that behold, many tax collectors and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. 
And so Jesus engages with this man, his life gets changed, and then more tax collectors and more sinners come. And how many of you know that when you just got saved, you couldn't wait to tell other people about Jesus? And you in actual fact knew a lot of people that didn't know Jesus. You knew a lot of unbelieving friends. Unfortunately, sometimes what happens, the longer we get saved, the fewer our unbelieving friends become, which is something we have to, we have to work at. It says that when the Pharisees saw Jesus eating with the tax collectors, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? And when Jesus heard this, he said to them, those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. So Jesus walks up to them and he says to those Pharisees, you guys think you are well. You just don't know how sick you are. The tax collector knows it. And Jesus was drawn to sinners and sinners were drawn to Jesus. In our nation, apart from the cultural baggage that wants to force your identity and wants to push you into a corner into believing that I'm so-called colored or brown or koi or ham or whatever first before I'm a Christian or I'm Afrikaner first, an Englishman or a Zulu or a Kosa before I'm a Christian, that cultural spirit that comes against us, with it is this religious spirit as well. That when an invitation comes and Christ walks into our lives and he says to us, follow me, or he says to us, respond, I want to heal you, I want to reach you, I want to touch you, there's something inside of us in the context in which most of us have grown up, I know some of you haven't, but most of us have grown up that says, ek is okay, ek is alright, ek kan hierdie doen. And unfortunately, unless you deal with the issue of identity, you will get away with it in an environment like this even, where you can submit to that spirit of religion. And how, how do you submit to it? Very quickly, I'm gonna just ask you a few questions. As I ask myself this, is there a Pharisee hiding in my closet? <laughs> I, I used to look at the Pharisees and I used to judge them, judge the Pharisees, yes. Which if you think about it, it's a very pharisaical thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> but they sort of, you know, we sort of understand, I won't judge anybody else but the Pharisees, them I can judge. Right, Pastor C, as we sort of sometimes feel like, yeah, the Pharisees, they deserve judgment. Let's judge them. And as I'm, I'm working through my, my identity and my healing, and it's a continuous process and my growing in healing in my identity, I've begun to discover that there's a little Pharisee in my closet. And I've got to deal with him very often. And he pops up in moments of failure. He pops up in moments when, when I don't achieve what I wanna achieve. And I wanna just give you a couple of questions that I use to check my own heart. Do you feel comforted by the thought that you are a better person or a better Christian than others in your life? Now most of us here will say no. And I'm thankful to God for that. But sometimes that will transition into the church down the road. Sometimes they will transition into later on in your life and you'd be surprised how many believers start judging one another because that lady chose to have a cesarean instead of giving birth normally. How many people judge one another because he's not speaking in tongues and, and, and I am? How many people judge one another because yes, she hasn't bre breastfed her baby or she is still breastfeeding her baby? He's homeschooling and he isn't homeschooling and how often some of those things can become things in our hearts. Why? Because of the Pharisee inside of us that at least wanna say, at least I'm not doing that. At least I'm not sleeping around like she is. At least I'm not on my third marriage. At least, at least, at least, at least. Are there certain people you find it hard to have compassion on? The Pharisees couldn't have compassion on the tax collectors because they were the ultimate betrayers. Are there certain, is, is there a no-go area in your life? Is there a no-go area? I have compassion on everybody, but don't talk to me about the racists. And don't talk to me about the pedophiles. And don't talk to me about, come on, we all have our buttons, don't we? But if we talk about a gospel of grace, then that grace is pervasive and gets in everywhere. Gets in everywhere. When you think about your spiritual life and how it's going, do you immediately look to what you have done for God? When you think about your spiritual life and how it's going, do you immediately go back to your last thing that you have done for God? It could even be how much time you've, you've prayed, how loud you've sung, 
when the last time was you ministered to somebody at the front? Do you feel comforted and confident after you've had a long quiet time, when you've given a lot of money, when you've shared the gospel a certain number of times? All issues of identity. And the last two questions, do you feel like you can't approach God when you aren't meeting your own standards of righteousness? And sort of one that hits me between the eyes very often. Do you pray longer, sing louder, give more when you are around others? Can I say that again? Do you pray longer, sing louder, and give more when you are around others? I urge you that you will do business with God and understand that your identity and your estimation in the eyes of God has got nothing to do with how long you pray, how loud you sing, and how much you give. And it sounds so cliches, but you know where I see it and a lot of other pastors see it? When some students leave an environment like this and there's nobody to cheer you on, clap, and you're by yourself. Do you still pray? Do you still give? Do you still serve? Because not something you do because of the crowd, but it's because who you are in your identity as a son, as a child of God. I've said a lot, but some of you need to come and you need to ask the Lord for the grace to detach your identity from the cultural baggage that all of us carry with us. I've spoken a lot of stuff all over the place, but all of us carry cultural baggage to a lesser or to a greater extent. You need to ask God for the grace to take you on a journey to separate those from your true identity. Show you the good stuff and show you the stuff you've got to say no. And some of us need to come this evening as well. We need to understand that we've carried with us a spirit of religion that wants to push us into performance. And how do you know that? How do you react when you have failed? I want us to stand and then I want us just to watch the short clip that I'm done. Okay? So let's just, let's just stand. It's a story that I've read, but it's a beautiful one. And as the Holy Spirit speaks to you, don't just want to respond as he ministers to your heart. They're all Jews. How can they live with themselves? Our own people working for Rome. These people make me sick. Collaborators. Let's move on. They're stinking vermin. You should keep your distance from them. Two men went to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, and the other one. tax collector. The Pharisee prayed, God, I thank you that I'm not like other men, thieves, adulterers, or this tax collector. But the tax collector didn't even look up to heaven. He said, God, have mercy on me. I'm a sinner. God bless the tax collector not the Pharisee. Anyone who praises himself for be humbled 
and anyone who humbles himself will be praised. Matthew, come. Now he even calls the sinners to follow him! <laughs>